All right, all right. Who's fired up to be in the house of God this weekend? Woo! Come on, Lord. It is so good to see you. We love you. We're thrilled that you're here. Thrilled that you chose to be with us and worship our God this weekend. Welcome to all of our campuses, online, in person, or maybe you're listening to this message later. We're super stoked that you're with us, excited. We believe God's going to do something incredible this week, this weekend. So, Father God, we come to you now. And, Lord, this topic is so important. And yet, God, none of us know what we don't know. And all of us have blinders. And so, uh, God, we've grown really uh, callous to just hearing a, hearing a message and, and not applying it to our lives. So, God, I pray that your, your word would be a mirror. It would be a hammer and it would be the fire that you said it is. And that you would light a fire in our bones. And that, God, you would transform us to live the life that you bought for us with your son on the cross. So God, speak to every heart to our prayer in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. again, welcome. We're just super excited to have you. Super glad that you're here. Uh, this weekend, Halloran Hilton Hill was supposed to speak. And uh, he texted me uh, Saturday morning and uh, said, are you still up? It was about midnight, which... It's going to be very odd for me to be up at midnight, but I just got back in the country from El Salvador, and I said yes. He called and said, listen, man, I'm so sorry. I know it's the last minute, but I can't speak this weekend. I said, hey, man, no problem. We love you, bro. You're part of the Faith Promise family. It's no big deal. It's, it's, it, and so I laid there when we got off the phone and said, Lord, I need, a, I need a message for this weekend. So everything I had pl planned for Saturday, I canceled, went to my bar in my office and spent all day there and begin to write down some things that I believe God wanted me to share with you. Are you with me? So as we get ready for Thanksgiving, I love Thanksgiving. I love it. It's family and food. It's, it's time off work and food. It's football and food. Anybody here love food like I do? Come on, let me, man. I'm going to deep fry some turkeys, and man, I, whoo, golly, bum. I'm, I'm so excited about what, about Thursday again. I love the holiday. I love it. I love Thanksgiving. And so I want to encourage you to lean in to this message. Just open your heart. God, speak to me and really lean in because I believe God will transform part of your life. As we've talked about all year, the hand that holds you. God wants to transform us into a life, Ephesians 3.20, exceedingly abundantly above what we could ask or think or imagine. Now, one other thing, if in your small group or in your friend group at Faith Promise that there is a single, would you make sure they have a place to go on Thursday? Are you with me? My mom will typically come up for Thanksgiving and she'll always say, is there going to be anybody else there? Well, yeah, mom. Well, can we just have the family? We are. We just have family from Faith Promise coming. Are you with me? I said that last year, and 23 people stopped me in the four years and said, what's your address? <clears throat> to which I gave him Josh Whitehead's. And so, and, and he, won't, he won't be there. So, uh, man, I, so I'm, I'm really fired up. So let me ask you a question. And here's, this is, this, I'm going to build on this, what the Lord gave me yesterday. Do you think that we all make assumptions? Do you think we make assumptions? Absolutely. So there's no question. When you pull up and the light is green, you assume that the person coming the other way has a red light. It's going to stop, right? It's not always the right assumption, is it? When I first got my motorcycle license at 14, I was driving down the road. I had the right of way. There was a car at the stop sign. I assumed that car saw me and was going to wait. No, no, pulled right out in front of me, literally slammed in her door, fell down. She rolled her window down, looked at me and said, what are you doing? I said, you pulled out in front of me. You see that big red sign, four letters, S-T-O-P? I made a wrong assumption. Are you with me? I thought that she was going to obey. She said, I'm so sorry, I didn't see, I didn't see. So we make assumptions that we, we, we have to. We just make them every single day. Some we choose. Some are made for us. Some are deliberate and some are by default. There are some assumptions we make because we're Americans, because of how much money you have, because of what color you are, because of what part of the country you live in. 
what political party you affiliate with. There are all these outside things that, that force assumptions on us and we never even realize. Here's what I want you to get because I really want to help you through the word this weekend. Wrong assumptions can ruin your life. Do you agree with that? Wrong assumptions and right assumptions can give you great victory. So Jesus said in John 8, 32, you shall know the, the truth and the truth shall, lies never set you free. Wrong assumptions never help you. They always hurt you. And so that's why we have to stay in the word so that we know what's right and what's wrong. See, assumptions are the lens through which we look at life. And so, would you agree that assumptions can help us or assumptions can hurt us? So let me ask you a question. If you had some wrong assumptions, would you want to know it? Four of you, would you want to know it? Again, that's why we get in the Word. And as, we, as we prepare for Thanksgiving, as we look at this message, I just first want to say, I'm so grateful for you. We, we love you. Michelle and I are so grateful for all you do, serve, give. Uh, it looks like it's going to be another record year on Heart for the Harvest offering. Come on. <clears throat> and more money is coming in this weekend, and so we're, we're waiting next weekend. I'll do the reveal. But Zach called me this weekend. I was in El Salvador preaching, and he calls, and I pick up the phone and figure it's something really important because obviously he called me. He said, Dad, 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 I got to talk to you. I got to talk to you. I said, okay. I'm in El Salvador. Oh, I forgot. This is so good, I got to tell you. So, sorry, talk to me. He said, I've been calling people and thanking them for the Heart for the Harvest gift. So, I've been calling people saying, hey, thank you, thank you. And I was working my damn list, and he said, I saw a staff member on the list that gave an incredible gift who shouldn't have been able to give that gift. Are you with me? There's just no way. So, Zach called and said, hey, I, man, I'm calling people saying thank you. Hey, help me understand <clears throat> what the world's going on with your gift or Heart for the Harvest. And he said, well, me and my wife have been saving up for a new house for years, tax refunds, everything. And when we were praying about Heart for the Harvest, the Lord said, give all your savings for the new house. Come on. That's how committed our staff is, by the way. And so, Zach, hey, man, I'm, Zach's weeping on the phone. Hey, I can't believe it. I'm so blown out of the water. I can't believe you did that. He goes, he, comes, he goes out of the office, gets Aaron and, uh, and our CFO and Tanji, his assistant, said, hey, make a note. We got to make sure this guy's kids have Christmas presents. I mean, we got we to make sure. The next day, that staff member called Zach back and said, hey, I got to tell you what happened. I had lunch yesterday with a couple of people that are very close to me, and uh, they knew that we were going to buy a house. And these couple of people said, hey, we're, they didn't even know about Hartford Horror, said, hey, we have a gift for you to help you. And, and he said, I'm not going to tell you what it was. I'm just going to tell you it was a six-figure check. Woo! Come on, somebody. And Zach said, I've got such little faith. I thought we had to do something. We shovel to God. God shovels back. God's got a bigger shovel. Now, everybody that gave a sacrificial gift didn't get a check. That's all right. We don't, we, we don't give to give, but we do give because we give if we give with the right motive. So if you have an incredible story, we'd love to know it. Send it to, to stories at faithpromise.org because we use those. That, that helps build other people's faith. So next weekend, we'll do the reveal and all also. All right, if you've got a copy of the Word, if you'll turn to Psalms 100, and I usually don't look at my iPad this much, but because I wrote this message yesterday, uh, we're going, to, we're going to do a little differently today. So again, I want you to really lean in. So Psalms 100, shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with what? Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are the people. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his course with praise. Give thanks and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. That's why I believe the next generation is going to see a greater move of God than what we've already seen in the first generation of faith promise. Because God's always about the next generation. So I look it up. 68 times in the Bible it says give thanks. And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other times 
The Bible says, be grateful, be thankful. So if you take all the ways that the command to be thankful is there, it is there virtually on every page of the Bible. Now, what you tend to think is the command is just for God, but in reality, it's for you. Because thankful people are joyful people. Are you with me? People that are not thankful, nobody wants to be around. Are you with me? They, 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 they just don't. So the command to be thankful is about you walking joyfully. There's an assumption you have to make if you're going to be thankful. And it's in verse 5 of Psalms 100. For the Lord is good. I've made an assumption that God is good. That makes Thanksgiving easy for me. I believe God is good. It's not about what circumstances that I tend to be facing right now. It's the fact that God is good. I live with that. I believe God's got the best in mind for me and for us and for you. I believe, assumption, that every day the world will attempt to inject me with doubt about God's existence or his goodness. That I live in a world that's anti-God and anti-Christ and at every corner I have to be alert because it wants to lick all the red off my sucker and it wants to, ru it wants to ruin all my gratitude. So uh, the psalmist didn't say when everything was good, give thanks, because that's circumstantial, or where we get the word happiness. It's a Latin word made of happenstance. If things are good in your life, then you are happy. That's a whole different thing from being thankful and joyful regardless of your circumstance. So let's go back. This is what I do when I, when I read a passage. I've got a pen and a highlighter and I'm circling words and I'm asking a question. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. When was the last time you shouted joyfully to the Lord? See, it's crazy because I watch y'all when we worship. It is amazing how many of you can shout joyfully to the Lord without moving your lips. We have a church full of ventriloquists. I mean, we got we a thousand Jeff Dunham's here who can sing and shout joyfully and not move their lips, who can sing and shout joyfully even though they look like they've been baptized in bad vinegar. Are y'all with me? Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth serve the Lord with what? Gladness. The happiest people at Faith Promise are people that serve here. They're winning team members. That's what we call them. They're the happiest people. They're owners. They're in. Man, if you haven't been in Next Steps since week three, uh, tonight at all of our campuses, man, come on, uh, Come back, got dinner for you, child care. Man, you want to find out how to get plugged in. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. See, the current culture tells you we made God in our image. The fact is God made us in his image. I don't care what the philosophers say. I don't care what UT says. I don't care what current culture, doesn't matter what Oprah says. I believe the Bible. Are you with me? I'm just going to stand on the scripture. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates. And so there's a process of accessing God. There are 12 gates around Jerusalem, and there's a gate to make your way to the temple mound, and you enter the gate making your way to God with thanksgiving. God, thank you for my life. Thank you for my health. Thank you for my family. Thank you, God, the, how you're blessing. And you just begin to list it. Man, we enter his gates with thanksgiving, and then we enter his courts with praise. Part of the reason some of us never enter praise is because we're not thankful. You cannot be, you cannot praise the Lord if there's no thankfulness in your heart. Because see, praise is about how great and glorious God is and magnificent, and so you got to make some assumptions. God's good all the time. Give thanks to him and bless his name. The Lord is good and his loving kindness lasts forever to all generations. My soul. We can look and find basically the same passage in the New Testament. Because some of you got to have New Testament. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says this, rejoice. How often? Rejoice when? Do you rejoice always? Some of you haven't rejoiced since the election. Because you thought there would be a red wave from Republicans who would take over. It didn't happen. And you've been mad since the election. The Bible says rejoice always, not just when your candidate gets elected. Are y'all with me? Rejoice always. And pray without ceasing. 
in everything give thanks. He didn't say for everything. I'm not thankful when someone I know gets cancer. I'm not thankful when someone I know gets a divorce. I'm not thankful when the economy tanks. I'm not thankful, but I am thankful in everything. I'm not thankful for everything. I'm just thankful. I'm gonna live in thanks, thanksgiving. And everything give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Verse 19, do not quench the Holy Spirit. Listen, if you are not thankful, if you are not doing these things, then you are gonna quench the Holy Spirit. Quench means to put the fire out. You're gonna put the fire out if you're not rejoicing always. Walk in gratitude. Don't despise prophetic utterance, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Examine means to to put a fire under an ore, gold or silver, to test the quality of the metal. Here's the deal. We've got to examine everything so that we know right assumptions and wrong assumptions. And we hold fast to those which are right, abstain from evil, every form of evil. Now the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, spirit, soul, and body, be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithfully, he who calls you, he will bring it to pass. See, that's another assumption. I believe our God's faithful. I believe our God is good. I believe God's looking to bless. I believe God is with us, in us, through us, and I believe God has got incredible plans for us. Anybody believe that with me? Come on. And when you don't, you quench the Holy Spirit. But see, as humans, when we have problems, pain, tribulation, Either God is not good or God is mad at me. When you make wrong assumptions, you do what Job's friends did. Wrong assumptions create wrong conclusions. Wrong conclusions create wrong assumptions about God. That's why 521, examine everything carefully. Examine it. See, our side is too limited to make assumptions about God that are not in the Bible. Paul said, we see through a mirror dimly. Now, I don't know about you, but I believe the word more than I believe what I see. Are you with me? Because my sight is limited. And so when bad things are going on, I'm still thankful. Why? Because I believe God is good and I believe God is in control. And man, I am just gonna walk with thanksgiving all the time. I'm just, I'm gonna do it. Now, so I'm gonna live at thanksgiving. It's a discipline. I learned thankfulness by journaling every day. As I've said before, I can't keep my mind focused when I pray, so I write my prayer down. Nobody can read them but me. I got all these hieroglyphics and abbreviations and all that kind of stuff. And I wrote every day, as I would have to, I would write a heading on a page, Thanksgiving, and I would list what I'm thankful for. Thank you for you, God. Thank you, save me. Thank you to call me. Thank you for this church. Thank you for my wife. Sometimes I was grateful for her children. But God, thank you for how you blessed. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And listen, something happened. The more I did that, the more thankful I became. Now, we're in Louisiana. We're poor as dirt. We don't have enough money to pay attention, and, and it is crazy. We have one car, and it's a hoopty. I'm not sure if the Gen Zs know what a hoopty, but it's a hunk of junk. And so it was this little old crappy car that when you start to open the door, sometimes the driver door would fall into the street. And Michelle would call me and say, Chris, I'm at such and such, the door fell off the car in the sub, in the, at the intersection. I said, pull over, I'll come put the door back on. And then a guy called me and said, hey, you only have one car. I'm gonna give you a car. My mom passed away, and I'm gonna give you her car. It's a Delta 88. It was a land yacht. It was incredible. It cranked every time, had AC, door didn't fall off. It was amazing. But it didn't have reverse. <laughs> now, See, you, you can't imagine how you could drive a car without a reverse in the hills of East Tennessee. In the flatlands of South Louisiana, it's not a problem because the biggest hill in Jennings, Louisiana was an overpass. So if I accidentally got stuck in a parking place, I'd open the door, Fred Flintstone, I'd just push. Push and I'd drive off. And every now and then somebody would see it. I was a little embarrassed. And they'd say to push, yeah, would you? Just push me out, I'm good. And so one day, Michelle said, when are you going to get rid of that crappy car without a divorce? I said, Michelle, I am so thankful to God for that car without reverse. You know why I was thankful? Because every day in my journal, thank you, God, for that car that family gave me. 
Thank you, God. Thank you, God. The more you work the discipline of gratitude, the attitude of gratitude, the more thankful you will become, the better you will be, and the more people will want to be around you. Are you with me? So it's not just about being thankful to God. It's just about what it makes us. Life is so much better with an attitude of gratitude. See here, and this is God really, man, this is, this, is where, this is what got me in my journal. So I'm praying and God's giving me ideas for the sermon. I'm writing them down, then I'll pray, then I'll write down. Here's the deal. Our assumptions create our attitudes. Our attitudes determine the level of the joy and victory you'll walk in. Because your attitude creates your altitude. And some of you wonder why you never walk in joy or victory because you have wrong assumptions and you're not living with an attitude of gratitude. Does this, this make sense? It, it, it just is. I was in, again, El Salvador last week, saw some incredible things. But in El Salvador is where I learned the lesson, the more you have, the less thankful you are. First time I went 31 years ago, we went to communities of abject poverty. There are virtually no communities like this in America, by the way. You want to see really poor people, you have to leave America. You just have to leave. And people say, Chris, you're so hard-hearted. If, if you think that, it's because you've never been on a mission trip. So we go to communities, running sewer, in the, running down the middle of the street, kids running around, no diapers. Man, they have not got, not, not only that I have a room, they don't have a toy. Everybody's smiling, everybody. Parents, kids, everybody's smiling. We were going door to door sharing Jesus. Man, come in. They'd have a house. Their whole house would be 10 by 10, a couple of hammocks and a little fire, and that's all they had, and everybody was happy. And I thought, God, the more we have, the less thankful we are. I mean, Solomon, the richest man that ever lived, wrote an entire book about how futile all his stuff was. He never once said, thank you, God, for all you've given me. Not one time did Solomon say, I'm grateful for the billions of dollars that I have. The more you have, the harder it is, because the more you have, the more you want. Does this make sense? This is why American Christians look like everybody else, because we become consumers. Again, there's an, there's, there is assumptions. So we've lost an attitude of gratitude. And so uh, we've got to get it back. This is what I think. I think God does so much for us that we never notice. Would y'all agree with that? I think when we get to heaven, he's going to show all the things he did for us that we just walked past. Now, the other day, I was in Michelle's car, and uh, I tried not to get in Michelle's car. And I tell her, you need a BFI sticker because she takes the grandkids, you know, and, and they, they you, you know what I'm talking about. And every time I get in Michelle's car, it's, it's just odd. It's always out of gas. Man, am I the only, I mean, I'm thinking, Michelle, do you just drive that sucker on E so that I'll, I'll have to go somewhere in it? Because I'm, there's a gas station two blocks from my house. I'm wondering, am I going to make it? <laughs> Negative four miles to empty. I mean, it's, you know. So I'm filling her car with gas. This is what I said. She'll never notice. She'll never notice. Of course, I do those things for her, and she doesn't notice. And so a couple days later, she walked in. Hey, did you fill my car up? I said, you noticed. She said, thank you. It felt so good that she noticed. And I think it feels good to God when you notice. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. Come on. It just is. It, 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 it's, it's just what God does. And so this Thursday when we have Thanksgiving, do me a favor, go around the table before you eat, food's ready, and everybody say one thing you're thankful for. Now, here's a caveat. You can't use anything twice. So when the first person said, I'm thankful for my family, it's off the table. So at our house, everybody wants to be one, two, or three. But you know what? We should never have trouble coming up with what we're thankful for. If we are just innately thankful people to God and all that God has done for us. I just, I love it. I, I love it. I mean, God is just so good. I, the Lord showed me something in El Salvador. That if I had this one experience in El Salvador, it's worth the trip. So we're preaching and we're, we're going and we go to one of the churches that we helped build 
a crusade that we did 25 years ago in the church that's there. Gentleman walked up to me, tears coming out of sheep. He said, hey, you don't know me. 25 years ago, he pointed out the door in the concert of football, in the soccer field, that you would not let your kids play in, in the soccer field. He said, you stood up and preached. My dad had a cigarette in one hand and a beer in the other, and my dad got up and gave his heart to Jesus. My mom got saved. We all got saved. I'm a pastor today because you came. I got to see what so seeds will do. It's incredible. I'm just overwhelmed with gratitude for all that God does. Does this make sense? And so an attitude of gratitude produces fruit. So on the count of three, all of our campuses, come on, all of you, on the count of three, I want you to shout out one thing you're thankful for. Are you ready? One, two, three. Okay, we're going to do it again. You can't use that one. One, two, three. Okay, we're going to do it one more time. You can't use either of those two or the what your neighbor just said. Here we go. You ready? One, two, three. You notice how it gets a little quieter each time? See, we just should be people of excessive gratitude. Just excessive. I'm so grateful to God. I'm so thankful. And I, I'm just so grateful for you and for my family and salvation. And I, I get to live Ephesians 3.20. I live a life that's exceedingly abundantly above everything I could ask or think or imagine. Thankfulness is a discipline you can learn. But you have to have the right assumptions. We live in a world. We live in a world full of Hatred, division, racism, injustice, judgmentalism, separation, political strife, polarization. Let's be the followers of Jesus that are different. Let's be thankful 24-7, 365. And when people stop and ask us, what is up with you? You just point your finger because you're a walking billboard. I'm just so grateful. So grateful. When I first got saved, and I had to leave my family because of the lifestyle and I couldn't be around it. So I broke ties with my family. First Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is tough if you're by yourself. And so somebody at church called and said, hey, Chris, come over to our house. And the next Thanksgiving, another family, hey, Chris, come and be a part of our family for Thanksgiving. There's an old song. I want us to see it. Some of you will know it. I want you to help me sing it. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood, joined heirs with Jesus as we travel this song. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Aren't you grateful? Aren't you grateful to God? I'm so grateful. And I wanna, I wanna live with gratitude. I wanna, I wanna live it. As some of you are struggling, some of you are walking through some really difficult situations. I get it, I understand. I got it. But there's always, there is always things to be thankful for. Maybe this Christmas, there's going to be one less seat at the table. Maybe this Thanksgiving, somebody has either left or gone on, or died. And you're saying, I, I'm, I'm going to have a real struggle. Maybe it's wrong assumptions. But if Thanksgiving is a little hard right now, we you hold your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm just walking through it. Thanksgiving's hard for me right now. Let's lift them up. Come on. God knows. Lift them up. There's, lift them up. Come on. Father God, we come right now, the people that are raising their hands. Lord, I pray that you would open all of our eyes to the goodness that you, the love, the faithfulness that you have. And God, would you show us how in a dark day, a day of difficulty and hatred and strife, where people have ripped, robbed, and raped us and done us wrong, how we can live with an attitude of gratitude. God, we, we believe that you're good. 
We don't care what the world says. We believe you're good. And so, God, would you open our eyes to your goodness, your faithfulness, you, your, you walk with us. And, God, we ask this be the greatest Thanksgiving that any of us have ever had. Not because of a feast, not because of a big house, but because we serve a God that is good. And all of us live beyond what we deserve. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for your blessing when we don't deserve it. Help us notice in Jesus' name. And all God's people said,